All right, everyone. I have the privilege of introducing our next breakout session. Howard Fisher is an associate professor of mass communications. He teaches classes in audio and video production, journalism, gender studies, mythology, and storytelling. He earned his PhD from Ohio University and has taught adjunct and graduate classes at the University of Minnesota at Moorhead, Texas Tech University, and the University of Ohio before teaching full-time at the University of Scranton. His research interests include credibility of journalism sources, mythological elements in storytelling, and gender representation in media and video games. Howard is also an author who writes under the name H. Dean Fisher. His novels are mythological tales that explore the themes of feminism, religious oppression of minorities, and the redemptive powers of love and acceptance. His most recent novel, Medusa, Rise of, Rise of a Goddess, is a feminist reimagining of the Medusa character from Greek mythology. The novel was a quarter finalist in 2022 for the Book Life Prize and a 2023 editor's choice in the Publishers Weekly Book Life section for independent authors. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Howard Fisher. Good morning. Thank you all so much. I distributed bookmarks for the Medusa book. If anyone who is here present with us did not get a bookmark, catch me afterwards, and you can certainly have one. I'm all about giving away things with my name on it. That's not a problem at all. So storytelling. I want to begin our discussion about storytelling by telling you a story. One of my loves is mythology. As he said, my latest book is a feminist revision of the Medusa story, but the story I'm going to tell you is from Norse mythology. Norse is one of my favorite groupings of mythology. People talk about and they read about and they think about Norse mythology and they think, oh, I just really can't understand what all these stories are about. Well, because the people who are telling the myths of the Norse pantheon of gods and goddesses were Vikings, and you have to think like a Viking. Think like you are standing on the uh, side of a mountain with a roaring fire and there's a snowstorm coming around and you're on your third pint of mead and you're like, yeah, let me tell you what happened to Thor. That's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about Thor. I'm sure you know who Thor is from the Marvel movies. That's nothing like what Thor was in the original Norse mythology. The story I wanna tell you is a theft of Thor's hammer. It seems to be that one morning when Thor woke up he looked at his bedside table and his hammer wasn't there. You know, the all-powerful Mjolnir, that hammer was missing. Well, of course, the first thing he thought of was Loki must have been the one to steal it. Loki is the trickster god. He's the one who's always causing trouble. He goes to Loki and he says, you stole my hammer. Loki says, I did not. I do a lot of things. I didn't do this. And Loki says, you know what? I think I know who might have it. Let me come back to you. Loki goes off to the world of the frost giants, and sure enough, he talks to Thrymir, one of the frost giants, and says, do you have Thor's hammer? And Thrymir says, I took Thor's hammer, and I'm not giving it back until I get to marry Freya. Now, Freya was the goddess of love and sexuality, and the goddess of prophecy. She was the one who could see into the future, and uh, Loki had a problem here, because there's no way he thought Freya would marry Thrymir the frost giant. So we went back to Thor and he said, okay, Thor, we found who has your hammer. Here's the problem. Thor said, not the problem. We'll just ask Freya to go marry Thrymir. It's no big deal. They go to Freya's front door, knock, knock, knock. They say, hey, Freya, we've got a deal for you. This frost giant wants to marry you and he'll give me back my hammer. And Freya looked them both in the eye and said, hell no. Slammed the door in their faces. And just in case they didn't get the message, she locked it. Click. Just like that. So Loki and Thor are still having their problems, trying to figure out what to do next. Loki says, I have a plan. So they go off and they find a wedding dress. And Thor puts on this wedding dress with the veil down in front of his face. And Loki brings Thor dressed in the wedding gown to Thrymir's kingdom and says, Thrymir, I present to you Freya, the goddess of love and sexuality and prophecy to be your bride. Thrymir gets so excited, he throws a party, they have a good time. Time comes time for the wedding, they sit down, and Loki says, hey, where's that hammer? And Thrymir comes up, sets the hammer down in what he thinks is Freya's lap, lifts up the veil, and there is Thor, grabs his hammer, whacks Thrymir across the head, whacks all the other frost giants, hikes up his wedding skirt, heads on home. 
proudly bearing his hammer back to his home. The story of the theft of Thor's hammer. One of my favorite stories. We're going to get to that story again in the end. As he said, who am I? Howard Fisher. I'm an associate professor of mass communication. I do audio video production. I teach journalism. I teach mythology. I teach storytelling. I'm also an author, as we discussed earlier, under H. Dean Fisher. My Medusa book is the latest book I've written for adults. I also write books for teenagers. Uh, that was um, Java is the character I created. Got my answer to the Harry Potter series, but because Harry Potter was not very nice to girls, my story is starring a girl who is the hero of that story. And then I have a book for grade school children as well. It stars the ancient Egyptian god Bess with a 12-year-old girl named Cory today, and they're interacting in today's world. I am a storyteller. It's who I was as a child. It's who I am now. It's who I plan to be as I go out in the future. And this is what we need to think about. Stories are the stories of our lives. It's who we are. It's what we do. It's where we're going to go. It's where we come up with our dreams. The stories tell us so much about ourselves, and your stories are unique. There's no one else who has a story like yours and you are the one who's determining where your story will be. Who was I? Let's look back to the past. I remember a time when I was like mm, five or so, sitting in the backyard, the trailer court where I grew up back in Bismarck, North Dakota, halfway across the country. And what am I doing? I've got a kite so high up in the sky. It's a Star Trek kite because I'm a Star Trek guy. I've been Star Trek all my life. And it's a Enterprise, the USS Enterprise, and it is so high in the sky, it's a tiny little dot up there in the clouds. And I'm thinking, I did that. I flew that kite. I put that kite up into the air. I'm flying the USS Enterprise. Captain Kirk is up there in my kite right now. What did I learn from that moment? I learned that I can do things like that. At five years old, I realized I have the power to launch a kite. I have a power to launch the Enterprise up in the sky. I can do that. I can build that. Let's fast forward a little bit. I was nine years old. I was in third grade. I'll tell you a story about a game I created. Now, let's put this into context first. This is the 1970s, okay, when I'm creating this game. And what is this game called? It's called, it's called the kissing game, okay? It was the 70s, I was nine years old, we hadn't quite learned what consent was yet, okay? It was called the kissing game. And what was the kissing game? If you've ever played tag, it was just like tag, except when we were tagging each other, we kissed each other, okay? That was the kissing game. Now, what did I learn from creating at nine years old in third grade this game? I had the power to bring people together. I could organize, I could tell them the rules of the game, craft something new, and I could do something. Might I be breaking social conventions? Yeah, I, I might be breaking some social conventions. I learned I could do that. Sometimes it's for the good. Sometimes it's not for the good. Sometimes social conventions need to be broken. Okay, Think about that. Sometimes there are social conventions we do need to break. And we have the power to do that by the stories we tell. Learning that we can bring people together to do these great things who I was, my self-worth, I can shoot for anything, I can bring people together. That's what I learned from my childhood. Who am I right now? I talked to you earlier, I said uh, my fandom is Star Trek. I have loved Star Trek all my life. What is Star Trek about? It's about equality, it's about unity, it's about building out science and making people come together to accomplish something. I think about uh, my childhood, uh, I was pretty young, five-ish again, I had this Star Trek Christmas. I got all these Star Trek gifts, Star Trek Enterprise set, I got Captain Kirk set, and Captain uh, Commander Spock set, all this stuff, and it inspired me with these passions of equality, of unity, of science, the things that helped me to be who I was, and prompted me to tell the story of my life through those lenses. What am I talking about even still today with the stories I tell? The Medusa story is about equality, it's about unity, it's about bringing something new to the story of Medusa and bringing more to her life. We get to tell our stories. Who I am right now is the story of who I am based on the story I tell, not anyone else. Other people will always try to tell your stories for you. Parents will try to tell your stories for you. They'll try to tell you who you are and where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing. Your friends will try to tell your story for you. They'll say, no one else is doing this. Why are you doing this? Or, you know what? Everyone else is doing this and therefore you must be doing this. Your friends will tell you these things. Your relatives will try to 
bring in on your life the stories that they think you should be telling. The authority figures in your life will be telling you what your story should be. All these people wanting to write your story for you. And what are those stories? Be a good girl. Be a good boy. Become a doctor. Become a dentist. Become a plumber. These are all the things that these people are trying to tell you to do. I have another story for you. We have, uh, I teach at the University of Scranton, and we have open houses down there. A friend of mine, John Kilker, he is a, an independent filmmaker. We have him teaching at the University of Scranton in our film production program. And he's at this open house meeting parents, meeting high school students. And what should happen but this mother comes up to him dragging her daughter behind her. Now, any of you who has been dragged somewhere by your parents, this is an embarrassing situation to begin with, right? So the mother is dragging her daughter along behind her, plops the daughter in front of my friend John Kilker and points to her daughter and says, my daughter wants to be a showrunner in New York City. Tell her why that's a bad idea. Wow. This mother knows the story her daughter should be telling about herself and obviously her daughter is not liking the story. Well, my friend John Kilker, he couldn't tell her that because of course being a showrunner is a legitimate path to moving forward and something you can do and she can certainly aspire to that and she could certainly achieve that. Someone is always trying to tell us our stories. My own parents tried to tell me what I should be. They told me that I should go to college. I heard that all the way growing up. I actually took that. I said, okay, sure, I'll go to college. And I went to a lot of college. Got my PhD and now I'm teaching at a university. I mean, I, haven't, I went to college and I didn't really leave. I'm still there. So yeah, I took that part. I allowed that story to become a part of who I was. But they also told me, you know what? You need to be a good Republican. This is the 1980s, right? The Reagan years. You need to be going to church all the time. You need to be reading your Bible. You need to be studying this. What did I decide to do as I grew up? I said, no, I'm gonna be a Democrat. And that produced a little bit of consternation between me and my parents. And I said, you know what? All this uh, Christianity thing that's good for you, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to become an atheist. I'm going to become someone different than who you are. I'm going to tell my own story about who I am. And yeah, I'm going to go into media. I'm going to be on television. I'm going to do my own radio shows. I'm going to be in these places and do these things. I'm telling my story. I have to be authentic to me and who I am and put my own passionate ideals out there. Again, equality, science, unity, the things that inspire me, I have to bring to other people. Who am I gonna be? The future, as I look where my next paths will take me. Well, storyteller is remaining a strong part of who I am. I spent my time on radio and television. I love radio and television. I'm teaching people to do radio and television today. I'm gonna tell you a story. It's all about stories, right? Let me tell you a story about working at a radio station down in Ohio. This was a tiny little station, a little alternative rock radio station that we had down there. And um, I was on from six in the morning until six in the evening. That's a long time to be on the radio. We were a tiny station, not very many people working for us. I was live from 6 a.m. until 12.30 in the afternoon. Everything from 12.30 on was pre-recorded, what we call in radio production, we call that voice tracking. And so even though I left the studio at 12.30, you still heard me for another five and a half hours on the radio. And my manager told me, he said, you know, there's this place called Obetti's just down the road. It was a hot dog and french fries joint. That's all they served, hot dogs and french fries. And they listened to us all the time. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I went down one day, walked a couple blocks to Obedi's, and I'm ordering my hot dog and my french fries. That's all they serve, hot dogs and french fries. It's a whole restaurant. And sure enough, there's a radio sitting up there playing our radio station. And as I'm ordering, I'm hearing myself on the radio announcing the next song and talking about the weather and what have you. And I asked him, say, do you listen to that station all the time? Oh, yeah, 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 we listen to that station all the time. He didn't recognize me. It's probably one of those little cool moments I had right there, OK? I am a storyteller on the radio, telling those people in that restaurant the stories of the music that they're listening to, and they are engaging with those stories. You have the power to spread your story to other people and let your story filter out to other people. You have the power to inspire other people by the things that are passionate in your own life. Think about the uh, keynote address that we heard earlier with Michael Bloxton and the inspiration that we gained from hearing him talk about his own life growing up on the just barely right side of the tracks in Philadelphia and now to owning these tech companies and telling us what story is. Everything was about the story of his life and where he's been and where he is and where he plans to go and where he plans to take us 
at the same time. Earlier, talking about our uh, previous speaker, we were discussing uh, how she got into um, getting people who need speakers uh, met up with people who are speakers and getting them to work together. And how did she tell the story? Because she started by telling me about an event that she went to that was bad. It was a horrible event. Three and a half hours of her life wasted down the drain, and she said, we can do better. That story inspired her to craft something, to create something new that is now helping the world to become a better place. Your stories of your life and the passions you have are going to help the world to become a better place. I'm a teacher now because I was trained and I love inspiring my students to go out and do great things. I love training them in audio video production. I love seeing the stories that they tell everyone else around them. I'm a book writer now because I had a passion from the time I was five years old to see my books in print and to tell people stories and to see those books on the shelves and to talk to people about stories that can inspire them. I do that now because of the stories I told myself growing up. Your dreams are your stories. Where you're going to go with your dreams, you will tell those stories going forward. Everything around us is storytelling. You might think, well, the easy things like theater, uh, audio video production, filmmaking, right, television, these are storytelling. Absolutely. And you can tell your stories through those mediums as well. That's one way in which you can tell story. Advertising, public relations, it's another form of storytelling. What are we doing in advertising? We're telling people what laundry detergent they need, right? This is the story of why you need this laundry detergent. This is the best laundry detergent you can possibly have. Public relations, we're telling people about the brand new phones that are out there. We're showing them, we're demonstrating to them about these new phones, and we're telling them the story of why they need this phone, and they're going to begin telling their own stories. Politics is all about storytelling. Usually politics is the story of how I'm right and the other guy is wrong. That's usually what politics is, but politics can be so much more than that. Politics can be inspiring. Politics can be, let's all come together as a group and let's decide that we're going to change the narrative. We're going to change the story. and We're going to do something new and we can go into politics and make new things happen through the stories that we tell and the people that we gather around us to help bring that story to more people. Graphic design. Graphic design is storytelling. You put a graphic on a t-shirt and you're telling a story to everyone out in the world who sees that t-shirt. You design a new interior of a home and you're telling a story about what should happen inside that home. Who should be there, what they should be doing, how they should be interacting. You're telling that story. Engineering is a storytelling. Engineering, you think, what, well, I'm going to build a bridge. How is that telling a story? Let me tell you a story about building a bridge. About an hour north of here is a little tiny town called Nicholson, and they have the Nicholson Bridge. It's this massive structure that was built over 100 years ago. I was there for the 100th anniversary of the Nicholson Bridge. They call it the Tunkhannock Viaduct. And what it is, it's a story that had to be created because something was wrong. You see, it used to be over 150 years, 120 years ago that the trains would come down into the valley and they would drop off their uh, people and they would drop off their goods, whatever they were doing, but the train couldn't get back up out of the valley by itself. It couldn't make that next hill back out and it couldn't go up that ridge. They actually had to have another engine come and push that train to get it back up out of the valley. Engineers come along, they say, we can solve this problem. They build a bridge, and suddenly that train doesn't even have to come down into the valley. That train can go over the top of the entire valley, telling a story through engineering. Entrepreneurship is storytelling. Entrepreneurship is simply the story of what do you see right now that needs to be changed? What do you see right now that could be better. What do you see right now that, hey, I have an idea. Why don't we do it this way? Why don't we make this? This would make this a little bit easier. This would make this a little bit better. And you begin crafting that story, and you begin leading the way, and you begin inspiring the people around you to come together, maybe to break a social convention. And again, maybe that social convention needs to be broken for your idea to work and make everyone's life a little bit better, to bring a little bit more peace, unity to the world. Maybe that's what we need. 
So to wrap up, who are we? Our stories form the foundations of who I am. They form the foundations of who you are. The stories of you growing up, the stories that you tell of your childhood, and the things that you did, all crafted to make who you are today. And you're beginning to tell those stories of who you are today. They're going to be different than what your parents tell you. They're going to be different than what your friends tell you, your relatives tell you. They're going to be different than what anyone else expects because it's your story, your individual story. And you get to craft that. And as you go forward and think about your dreams and think about where you're going to be, what you're going to do, you can inspire other people. You can influence them. You can push to get those things done by the ideas that you come up with. I love that question that we started the uh, keynote address with. Um, I forget the man who was doing the introduction. Talking about receiving the question, what is something I could do that would be entrepreneurial? What is something I could craft? Was it, you know what? You are the one that can answer that for yourself because you know as you look out into the world what you see that is not living up to the story you want to tell. We decide how our stories go. We decide what we're going to tell and where we're going to go. Back to Thor, back to Loki, back to Freya. Thor had a problem when he woke up that morning. His hammer was missing. He had a decision to make. How, what am I going to do about this problem of my hammer missing? Freya had a decision. Am I going to go along with this crazy story about uh, marrying Thrymir the frost giant? Or am I going to do something different? She chose to do something different. That wasn't a part of the story she wanted to tell about herself. Loki. Loki had a reputation of being the bad guy. Loki had the reputation of always do, causing mischief, doing bad things to other people. And he had a choice in that moment. Was he going to allow that story to continue or not? And he said, no, this isn't me. In fact, I will help you. This is a story I'm going to tell. The story of being the good guy. The story of using my craftiness and using my imagination to help you, Thor, get your hammer back. And what did Thor do? Thor had the choice of, I can just let Thrymir keep my hammer, or I can do something about that. And if it requires putting on Freya's wedding dress to go get my hammer back, then I'm going to go put on Freya's wedding dress, and I'm going to go get my hammer back. And he did. Your story, your passion, your drive, you're going to make such great things happen. Thank you so much. We still have time for questions, yes? Excellent. Who has any questions about anything? Thank you. Um, a fantastic topic. I, um, I, I teach entrepreneurial mindset at uh, Penn State, and storytelling is one of those things that, I mean, it's just a skill set that you do need whether it's in a job interview, whether it's, you know, becoming an entrepreneur or whatever, I think storytelling is extremely important. A question I have for you is, is there a, a, a structure? Is there a structure for setting up a story that, and then kind of a little, a tiny add-on, like, at one point is the story too long? <laughs> So is there a structure to telling a successful story? And at what point is the story too long? You know, the best way to learn to tell stories is to tell more of them. And to tell them in a situation where the stakes are not as high. You talk about needing stories for jobs, needing stories to tell your, uh, to become an entrepreneur and to get other people on board with you. Start with telling stories to your family. Start with telling stories to your neighbors. Start with telling stories to your friends, and you're going to learn with each telling the things that work and the things that do not. As for when the story becomes too long, again, the more times you tell that story, the more you're going to learn about when it's appropriate to stop the story and when it's appropriate to continue on. When you're looking out at an audience like this and you begin to see people uh, yawning, you begin to see people shifting in their seats, you begin to see people kind of looking at their watch, like, oh, what am I going to do next? You know the story has gone on too long. And that's the time to shut up and just let it go. The same thing happens in an interview situation. When you're in that interview situation and you're telling the story and the person is 
interviewing you for the job, is looking at you and thinking, should I give you $10,000 to start your company or not? And that be person begins shifting their papers and looking away from you. Stop right there. I have a story about that. A friend of mine, uh, another friend who's a writer, uh, this is a story from about 20 years ago, he had an opportunity to pitch his book to an agent, a New York City agent. And um, as he was pitching his story, the agent got very interested and reached in his pocket for the business card and was leaning forward. And my friend is a talker. My friend loves to tell stories, and he will tell stories all night long if you let him. And he kept on talking, kept talking. The whole time he's talking more and more. And the agent took his hand out of his pocket, leaned back in his chair. His opportunity was gone because he didn't realize when he needed to stop talking. Practice your stories, tell your stories to more people, learn the craft of storytelling, it will come as you watch your audience. Does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, thank you. What other questions do you have? You can tell this is my passion, I love storytelling. And we can find storytelling, as I said, in every possible area that we work in. When I was on the radio, I'd tell stories all the time. A microphone like this, I wouldn't see my audience, but I would have my audience out across the airwaves, and I would tell stories while I was on the air. I loved it. Who has a question? Yes. By the way, I love your hair. Mine's blue. It's kind of faded a little bit, but yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to ask. Do you have any advice on how to get people to maybe listen and really understand your stories better? How do we get people to listen and understand our stories better? You're not going to like my answer because it's the same answer I gave last time. Practice. The more times you tell that story, and especially telling the same story, the story of the theft of Thor's hammer, I have told that story so many times, okay? Um, because that's a story that I use in teaching uh, my mythology class. And it's my favorite story. It's my daughter's favorite story. My daughter is named Freya because uh, we, again, think, look to the Norse pantheon of gods and goddesses. Um, how do we get people to engage? How do we get people to stay with them? Um, practice it. Notice when they're paying most attention. Notice when they begin to fade away from that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you have a follow-up to that? Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. What else? Ah, did I ever tell stories as a child to get out of trouble? I'm sure I did, and I really don't remember them. Because you, do you? You have a story from your child? Can you give her the mic back? Oh, it's just too many. <laughs> oh, tell, do you have time to tell us one of your stories of getting out of trouble? The thing about me was, and while you're thinking about that, the thing about me is my mother will tell you that I was kind of a goody two-shoes. I didn't tend to... Uh, get into trouble that often. So I didn't have to fabricate stories very much. I just, I just looked like a goody two-shoes, but I wasn't. Uh, just a funny story that, that I, I was thinking about this as you were talking, is there was a day that I was chasing my brother. My mom and dad were not home. And I was chasing my brother, and he jumped from one spot in the house to another to get away from me. And as he landed, screaming in terror, he hit his front tooth, and it broke in half. Oh, ouch. So I said to him, don't tell mom. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I don't know if I can't tell her. <laughs> and it was, just, it was just funny because I was starting to think, what story can I make up that would make sense for him losing half of his front tooth? And, uh, and there wasn't one. There wasn't one. But I think that's part of our human nature is when something happens, how do we react to it? Yes. You know, there have been many times when <laughs> I felt awkward about something and my husband or, or kids will walk in and I'll say, I'm not telling you what happened. I'm just, I'm just cleaning up this mess, what happened. Um, I just think that's funny, the way we use stories to engage people, put people off, how we uh, change a story based on a situation and how much we want to reveal. And that takes us into interpersonal communication, which is a different area of study. But I, I just think that's fascinating how we as humans make those connections. Absolutely. Um, you know, my Irish friends always say, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. So I always have to take what they say with a grain of salt. And every time you tell the stories, we're going to learn, as I said, how to tell them better. The story of the theft of Thor's hammer, because I've told that story so many times. I know the beats that work. I know when to speed up that story, when to slow down that story a little bit with each different audience. Who has a story about getting yourself out of trouble? 
She just asked that very good question. Who has a story of when you got yourself in trouble and you had to talk your way out of it and you created something in the moment, you crafted something? Anyone have something like that? My daughter will try it all the time. She's 13, and she will try to create stories all the time to get herself out of trouble. The thing about it is she has enough self-awareness within her own body to know that she's telling something really stupid, and she'll just start laughing in the middle of her story, and it's perfectly obvious that she's lying, and we know it's lying, and we laugh at her because she's trying to tell this story, and it becomes a good humorous moment as she tries to get herself out of trouble. And then we calm down. We say, okay, now, you know, you're not going to go to the park tomorrow or something, whatever the punishment might be for whatever she did in that moment. Anybody have a story that you could tell? Who has a story of a success? Something that worked well in your life when you said, I'm going to make this happen, and you made it happen. You did it. Anyone have a success story like that? In the back. Hold on. He's bringing the microphone to you. Hi, my name is Kelly. Um, so when I got to high school, I met my first ever exchange student, and they were, it was a girl from Norway, and they were the most, like, they were the most popular kids in high school. I thought it was so cool that the exchange students, that they, you know, left everything behind and built a new life, moved to America, did not know the language, did not know anyone, and built a life, and they were so young. And so as soon as I found out what an exchange student was, I was like, I want to do that. And so I thought about it every single day for four years prior to going. And I was like, I'm going to do this, because if they could do it, so can I. And so I, um, I looked through programs, and I went with Rotary International. And I, for my senior year of high school, I was an exchange student in Argentina. And that was the turning point in my life, because I think of my life like before then, I wasn't super outgoing and I, I wasn't super um, extroverted, but then after that year, I had to move and not know anyone and try to learn the language and make friends. And obviously I had help along the way from many people, but that was the most important thing I ever did for my life and it changed my life post then. Absolutely, and what an incredible story, yeah, yes. And I love the way you frame that story. You were inspired by something that happened. That's the past. You decided in that moment in the present that you were going to do this. And you set that dream course ahead of you to make it happen. And as you said, your life, you can think of your life before the exchange, and you can think of your life after the exchange. Beautiful story. Who else has another one? Right over here. So, hi, my name hi. is Ian. Um, to give a little backstory, uh, over the summer, um, I'm in Boy Scouts, and through my whole career, uh, career experience, I've been going to a summer camp uh, for a week every summer, right? And then I got the opportunity to sign up to work at it, all right? So I started working there in 2021, and I work specifically in the nature area, so I teach badges about environmental science and astronomy. And the big thing about it is, you know, the nature has its staff and it has its director. And throughout my whole first summer, um, our first director, he left to go to the Marines. And our second one was only there for two weeks. And then our third one was, he kind of stepped in last minute, so he didn't have much experience. But it was the same guy who I got to work under uh, during 2021. And his way of solving problems and teaching the staff was very, very odd. It involved a lot of yelling and a lot of stern, and maybe it was because he went to a very uh, heavy military college, but I kind of realized that like being the director one day is something I wanted to be. And so when I got the opportunity this year, when I got my acceptance letter in the mail saying that they were considering me to be the director, I was kind of ecstatic. And I got there the first week and I realized, well, this is it, what now? And then I realized, you know, I have to step up and I have to learn and I have to go ahead. And so I spent the first three or four weeks of the summer really learning and adapting and connecting with my staff and the scouts. And that was something I realized was I became the director that I would have wanted to work under. And if I were still a scout going there, I would want to go to their area and talk to them and be with them. I really felt like I made a great connection with my staff and my scouts and I became what I needed. 
Fantastic. Good. I especially like the part of your story as you're crafting and telling us the story of how you saw what happened and how you decided in the moment and what you decided to be going forward. You looked to not only the things that inspired you, but you looked to the things that didn't work. The one man who was yelling, and you said he's probably from his military background or whatever, but he was yelling at the people and you decided for yourself you weren't going to be that person. I love that. We craft these stories of who we are. We make these decisions. We should be proud of the decisions that we make. We should be proud of how we decided to move forward and what we decided to be. I don't know how much time we have. I don't know if there's any more questions. I don't know if there are questions online. Uh, I think we're just about out of time. Are we? We have more, a little more time? Uh, no, we're, out. we're out. Okay, we're out of time. Well, I want to thank all of you once again for showing up. Thank you.